we began this series of videos with the assertion that Sikhi as it is practiced today is no longer the Sikhi that was gifted to us by our Gurus. It's a spirituality that stands distorted, corrupted and tainted. Our scripture, Gurbani, has been distorted through Vedic and Puranic based interpretations and translations. Our history has been muddled in unbelievable tales of miracles called Sakhis. The general conduct of Sikhi has come to be dictated by a self-serving clergy class and our religious practices have come to consist primarily of those smuggled in from rejected and discarded rituals of the pre-1469 belief systems. In short, Sikhi today stands as a faith that has been hijacked from its unique path and equally distinct goals. Three powerful groups, all of which were fake, deviant and anti-Sikhi conducted this hijacking, by which I mean the distorting, the corrupting and the contaminating of Guru Nanak's divine spirituality. The three groups did so by taking over our institutions, distorting our historical narratives, corrupting our literature and controlling our Gurdwaras, the outcome of all of which was the hijacking of the fate and psyche of Sikhi for a long period of 207 years from 1718 till 1925. In today's video, Piario, we will look at the role played in the hijacking of Sikhi by the first group, the Udasis. The Udasi sect was started by Sri Chand, who was the elder son of Guru Nanak. Now he refused to accept Guru Nanak's choice of Pai Lenaji as Guru Angad. He had wanted to be installed Guru to succeed Guru Nanak. He failed in his quest for Guruship, but he did succeed in gaining control of Guru Nanak's ashram at Kartarpur. Now, Guru Angad was forced to move to Kadur, which then became the center of Sikhi, replacing Kartarpur. Sri Chanda thus hijacked Kartarpur for himself and for his anti-Guru Nanak drive, his anti-Guru Angad push and his anti-Sikhi work. Six basic facts regarding Sri Chanda and his Odasi sect must be brought to the attention of the Sikh world. First, Sri Chand's breaking away from Guru Nanak Sikhi was in essence rooted in a very deeply devious plot of the Brahmin clergy to undermine Guru Nanak. The roots of the plot go back to the day Guru Nanak refused to put on the Janeu. The Brahmin clergy saw young Nanak's refusal to wear the Janeu as the sowing by Guru Nanak, the seed of a foundational challenge, a challenge that threatened the position of the Brahmin clergy as the undisputed spiritual leader of the people. The rejection of the Janeu was more than just a refusal to wear a symbol of faith. The rejection was a philosophical uprooting of a core belief of the Brahman clergy. The refusal to wear the Janeu was also an act which defied the Brahmin's religious position. 
Now the manner in which the rejection of the Jindayu was done became material to the anger of the Brahmin clergy. You see, Pyareo, when Guru Nanak's father, Mehta Kalyandas, had arranged for the ceremony of the Janeu wearing for Guru Nanak, the Guru could have stated his objections in private and gotten the ceremony cancelled. But Guru Nanak repudiated the Janeu and the Brahman clergy's position in a very public way in the presence of a large crowd and the Brahmin clergy was not about to take it lightly. One can imagine that the Brahmin clergy did not sleep well that particular night. Guru Nanak had struck a blow to the Brahmin clergy's roots. He had undermined the clergy's standing as the spiritual leader of the religious world. He had undercut the clergy's control and hold over the people. The revenge-filled Brahmin clergy could not take on Guru Nanak directly, so he targeted Guruji's two young children. The result was the hijacking of the faith of his two children who were besieged mostly while Guru Nanak was on his long travels during the major part of his adult life. The conversion of Sri Chand into the ash-covered, loincloth-wearing, celibate and wandering yogi of the Sevji sect was ultimate revenge and triumph on the part of the Brahmin clergy. Now, it was triumph because the Brahmin clergy managed to cultivate a destructive mole a damaging force right in the heart of Sikhi, right inside Guru Nanak's household and right within the psyche of Gurmat. Through Sri Chand, the Brahmin clergy had succeeded in infiltrating deep within the epicenter of Sikhi. This mole in the form of Sri Chand would serve the Brahmin clergy's anti-Sikh agenda for centuries to come and it would serve him very well indeed. Now, the second thing the Sikh world needs to know is that Sri Chand's Udasi sect was started in opposition to the Sikhi of Guru Nanak. Its objective was to challenge Sikhi, to reject Guru Nanak's Gurmat and, if possible, to replace it while he, meaning Sri Chand himself, acted as the self-proclaimed Guru. Third, we need to know that the sect was propagated with a vengeance, the revenge being rooted in Guru Nanak's decision to not pass the Guruship to Sri Chand. Guru Nanak acted such because he found Sri Chand absolutely unfit for the spiritual responsibility. Guru Nanak also did not subscribe to the principle of hereditary passing of Guruship. Instead, Guru Nanak found Pai Lena spiritually qualified to be the successor Guru. Now, the fourth thing we Sikhs need to know is that at the core, all that Sri Chand and his Udasi sect stood for was in antithesis to Guru Nanak Sikhi. Sri Chand rejected Guru Nanak's spirituality in totality and across the entire spectrum of all that Guru Nanak advocated. The Udasis rejected everything Sikhi from the very foundational Sikh notion of the creator within to the advocated family life or Grista Jeevan. Even Sri Chand's garb, the wearing of a loincloth or langoti, stood in stark and clear contrast to Guru Nanak's garb. The fifth thing we need to know is that Guru Nanak did not approve 
of the Udasi sect or their ways, genuine and authentic Sikhs of Guru Nanak abided by such disapproval and did not associate themselves with Sri Chand in their spiritual endeavors. Now, the sixth thing we Sikhs need to know is that Guru Nanak's command to Sikhs was to accept Guru Angad as his successor Guru and to reject Sri Chand. Now, Pai Gurdas Ji says the following about the issue of succession and Sri Chand in war number one, body number 38. Ulti Ganga Vahayan Gur Angad Ser Upar Tara Putri Kaul Na Palaya Man Khote Aki Nasyara meaning Guru Nanak performed an extraordinary practice in instilling Angad as his successor Guru. His sons defied his spiritual decision on account of their malice and rose to rebellion and desertion. The idiomatic term Ulti Ganga Vahayan literally means making the Ganges flow upstream. Now, this idiom signifies the rejection of the hereditary passing of Gurgadi from father to the eldest male offspring, something that was in practice then. Pais Satta and Balwanda in Ram Kliwar, Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji, page 967, say the following regarding the same issue. Sikha Putra Kokh ke sab ummat vekho je keon, jaan sudosh ta lehna tekeon, meaning Guru Nanak evaluated the entire congregation of Sikhs and his offspring. Upon due assessment, Lehana was deemed worthy of succeeding him. The war goes on to explain the decision, particularly relating to why Guru Nanak did not pass the Guruship to his sons. Sacha Jai Guru Furmaya Kyo Edu Bola Hatiya Putri Kaul Na Palio Kar Piro Kand Muratiya Del Khote Aki Ferna Band Par Uchai Chatiya Meaning Guru Angad accepted the godly spirituality as advocated by Guru Nanak. The sons rejected it, Putri called Napaleo, disobeyed and defied Guru Nanak Kar Piro Kand Muratiya. They were malicious and deviant, Del Khote, turned their backs on Guru Nanak, Aki Feran, and lived under the burden of worldliness. Now, taking all the above verses together, we can deduce the following six observations. First, that Sri Chand rejected the Sikhi of Guru Nanak while acting under the influence of the Bipar conspiracy. Second, he showed a defiance to Guru Nanak. Third, he was malicious and deviant. Fourth, in doing so, he would live under the burden of spiritual wandering, by which it was meant that he would be in a fruitless search of spirituality and divinity, but he would never obtain it. Fifth, Sri Chanda did not accept Guru Angad as the succeeding Guru. He stood in defiance and disapproval of Guru Nanak's choice and decision. And sixth, the driving force of Sri Chanda and his Udasi sect was revenge. A revenge against Guru Nanak's decision to deny him the Guruship. He was defined by his yearning to avenge not just that one single decision but each and every spiritual principle that Guru Nanak ever advocated in his entire life. 
So taken as a whole and based on the above verses from Gurbani and the writings of Pai Gurdas Ji, it is crystal clear therefore that Sri Chand and his Udasi sect were anti-Sikhi of Guru Nanak from the point of conception. It is also clear as daylight that Sikhs of Guru Nanak ought to have nothing to do with Sri Chand and his Udasi sect. So given such circumstances, we can surmise that those who advocate Sri Chand and his Udasi sect as either part of the Sikh psyche or as an acceptable limb of Sikhi would stand guilty of being party to the essence of Sri Chand. They stand guilty of associating with everything Sri Chand represented, which was to avenge Guru Nanak and to revenge Sikhi. They are further guilty of either standing in support of the hijacking of Sikhi or being oblivious to it. So, put in simple terms, what we see in Sri Chand and all that he intended to achieve is the planting of the seed of hijacking of Sikhi. As stated above, upon installation of Guru Angad as the second Guru, Guru Nanak sent him, meaning Guru Angad, to Khadur Sahib, which would subsequently become the next epicenter of Sikhi after Kartarpur. Now, we know that Kartarpur was an established ashram where Guru Nanak spent the final 12 years of his life preaching Sikhi. Kartarpur was recognized, was famous and was well attended by huge crowds of Sikhs. Yet Guru Angad was sent to Kadur, a totally new place that had to be built from scratch. Guru Angad was instructed to relocate to Kadur by Guru Nanak because of the intense ugliness and viciousness of the conflict that was incited and caused by Sri Chand's desire for revenge and desire to take over and control Kartarpur. There was a reason for this and it had to do with the succession plot of Sri Chand. Now, Sri Chand initially kicked up a storm over his failed bid to be appointed successor to Guru Nanak. So when that failed, he forcefully staked his claim over the ashram at Kartarpur, which he intended to use to lay claim to being the rightful claimant as Guru Nanak's successor. He figured if he had Kartarpur, he would inherit the crowds, he would inherit the statue of Kartarpur as Guru Nanak's ashram, and he would inherit it as the epicenter of Sikhi, and by default inherit the guruship as well. Now his logic was simple. He figured he who had control over Kartarpur was the guru. In any case, Pyareo, Kartarpur would become Sri Chand's home and the center for the establishment of his deviant Udasi sect. In other words, Kartarpur would be hijacked from being the center of Sikhi to becoming the epicenter of everything that was anti-Sikhi under Sri Chand's Udasi sect. Kartarpur would be hijacked from being the home of the authentic Sikhi of Guru Nanak to become the headquarters of the deviant anti-Sikh agenda of Sri Chand. It would become the headquarters of Sri Chand's Brahmin clergy backers and the epicenter of other anti-Sikh forces of the day. Guru Nanak sent Guru Angad to Kadur because he expected and wanted authentic Sikhs to break away from Sri Chand occupied Kartarpur and go to the rightful Guru at Kadur instead. 
Now Guru Nanak himself stayed back at Kartarpur till his passing a week or so later and there was an inherent purpose in this decision too Guru Nanak Padshah knew that Sikhs would still come to Kartarpur to pay obeisance to him Guru Nanak even after he had appointed Guru Angad Guru Nanak thus continued to direct all Sikhs who kept coming to Kartarpur to go to Khadur instead telling them that the real guru was in Khadur it was clear that Guru Nanak wanted Sikhs to continue their journey in Sikhi with Guru Angad ji at Khadur and not associate with Sri Chand at Kartarpur associating with Sri Chand would have caused their Sikhi to become deviated from Guru Nanak's path Guru Nanak's inherent purpose thus was to keep authentic Sikhs away from the Kartarpur of Sri Chand this became Guru Nanak's mission right till his last and final breath Guru Nanak's decision to send Guru Angad to Khadur and hand over the ashram and all the assets to Sri Chand resolved the dispute over the succession issue but it also gave Sri Chand a ready built headquarters gave him ready crowds of Sikhs and handed him an opportunity to rival Guru Angad even if authentic Sikhs accepted Guru Angad and moved to Khadur Sri Chand would continue living at Kartarpur he asserted that he was Guru Nanak's rightful successor and he announced that he had the remains of his father in the form of ashes of Guru Nanak and that made him the Guru's rightful successor now the metaphor is earth shattering really to authentic Sikhs Guru Nanak left the enlightenment of Sikhi the Jyot of Sikhi in the form of divine eternal Shabd based messages with Guru Angad we know that Guru Nanak recorded all his Bani in his personal pothis he gave all his Bani pothis to Guru Angad to Sri Chand who was bent on reducing all that Guru Nanak stood for to ashes Guru Nanak left him his own ashes and Sri Chand used these ashes to lay claim to being the successor Guru but ashes was all he had at Kartarpur Sri Chand built a distinct following consisting of disciples who had a personal loyalty to him new recruits from a variety of pre-1469 groups began to join him he was actively supported by the Brahmin clergy and their institutions he especially attracted classes of people who were anti Guru Nanak people who wanted Guru Nanak to discontinue his enlightening ways in the minds of such people Sri Chand's Odasi sect provided the perfect opportunity to both co-opt Sikhi into the Sanatan fold and to expunge Guru Nanak from the psyche of Indian spirituality the defining character of Sri Chand was that his Udasi sect was based on principles that were in total contradiction in absolute defiance and a complete antithesis to the Sikhi of Guru Nanak for example the Udasis shunned the householder's life and practiced austerities Sri Chand adopted celibacy advocated Kundalini Yoga doubled in occult practices claimed to possess Riddhi Siddhi magical powers and made dubious claims towards supernatural powers all of which were rejected by Guru Nanak in his philosophy the Udasi sect would thus remain out of the domain of Sikhi none of our Gurus 
came into contact with any of the Udasis, even if Sri Chandra did flaunt his biological relationship with Guru Nanak openly. The Udasis, however, never gave up their claim that Sri Chandra was the true successor to Guru Nanak and that they were the true custodians of Sikhi. This belief became the genesis, the origin, the point of conception of their attempt to hijack Sikhi when the opportunity arose. The hijacking of Kartarpur would progress surely and steadily towards the whole scale hijacking of Sikhi as the year 1718 approached. And when 1718 did come and bring with it the most disastrous, tragic and catastrophic circumstances for Sikhs and Sikhi, the Odasis were waiting and ready to allow the hijacking to unfold. Eight years after the demise of Guru Gobind Singh Pacha, and only months after the defeat of Baba Banda Singh Bahadur in 1718, the Udasis would finally get their big break. The opening was created by the vacuum that resulted from the brutal hunting and killing of authentic Sikhs by the regime of the day. Throughout the Shahidi era, which lasted some 60 years after 1718, or what is commonly known as the era of Sikh persecution, authentic Sikhs were massacred as individuals and as groups. It was during this period that authentic Sikhs faced two holocausts. The first on 17 June 1746, when Lakhwat Rai slaughtered some 25,000 Sikhs, and the second occurred on the 5th of February 1762, when Ahmad Shah Durrani killed 50,000 Sikhs. These were the same 60 years when Sikhs were being hunted with a price of up to 80 rupees on their heads. Now, while all this massive persecution and genocidal murder of authentic Sikhs was happening, the Udasis moved in to occupy one Sikh Gurdwara after another that was left vacant. Anandapur Sahib, Hazur Sahib, Darbar Sahib, etc. were taken over, followed by virtually all Gurdwaras of importance. The regime did not arrest, did not prosecute and did not harass the Udasis because they were considered as non-Sikhs. It was well known that the Udasis visited Hardwar during Kumbh Mela, practiced Kundalini Yoga, stayed celibate, and adorned their own symbols and garb. There was thus no confusion that the Udasis were non-Sikhs, but yet they occupied, controlled, and administered Sikh Gurdwaras with total impunity. Authentic Sikhs, in love of their gurus and their institutions, occasionally came out of their hideouts in small groups to pay homage to Darbar Sahib and other historical Gurdwaras. These Sikhs were simply glad that there was someone who took care of their Gurdwaras and kept their doors open. The spouses and children of some of the authentic Sikhs who took the risk to not live in hiding would share this sentiment as well, even though they were aware that the Udasis were corrupting Sikh practices. While the ruling powers battled to annihilate and exterminate the authentic Sikhs who had taken cover in the jungles of Punjab, the deserts of Rajasthan and Bikaner and the hills of Jammu and Kashmir, the Udasis were in a battle of their own to annihilate and exterminate Sikhi by occupying Sikh institutions and corrupting, distorting and contaminating Sikhi in their dubious role as the custodians of Sikhi. The Udasis would be in total and exclusive control of Sikh Gurdwaras for about a period of 60 years before 
they would have to share control with other more powerful deviant groups for a total period of 207 years until 1925. Pario, although the Odasis faced no physical resistance in their control of Sikh Gurdwaras and in introducing Odasi deviant practices, rituals and beliefs into the Gurdwaras, they still felt a need to establish themselves firmly and deceptively within the parameters of Sikhi. Now, they needed to do so as they knew authentic Sikhs were very well grounded in the Gurbani and Gurmat. And this reality presented a danger to their control of our Gurdwaras. The objective of the Odasis was therefore straightforward. They needed to anchor their legitimacy amongst authentic Sikhs and thus gain trust and acceptability. To do such, they built a corrupted version of Sikh spirituality that was parallel to the Sikhi of Guru Nanak. One that could be interwoven into authentic Sikh philosophy and one that was grounded in Udasi beliefs. They could not alter, they could not rewrite, and they could not add anything to the Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji, the core of Sikhi from 1708 onwards. It was too mammoth and too risky a task for the Udasis and they were perhaps not up to the job as well. They thus resorted to creating concocted tales relating to the lives of our Gurus and about corrupt Sikhi practices. This was essentially a cunning attempt to recreate and rewrite Sikhi from the periphery while leaving the core, meaning leaving the Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji intact. They rewrote the periphery through the creation of concocted Sakhis and corrupt practices. So they calculated that the core, meaning the Guru Granth Sahib, would become tiny and irrelevant once the periphery had become sufficiently corrupted and sufficiently distorted. Even if relevant, the core would become unbelievable once the periphery had become part of the Sikh psyche. How they did this, in other words, how they hijacked Sikhi from its original philosophy, from its original goals and from its original intent will be the subject of part 3 of our video series. Join me Pyareo in part 3 to see how the plot to hijack Sikhi took shape under the command and control of the Udasis.